something that will make God absolutely livid. When you've got several episodes that span hundreds of years on their own, it makes sense to come out of the series with a lot of questions. Netflix's The Sandman has finally landed on the streamer, and it's time to break down the who's, the what's, the where's, the why's, and just what's going on with season one's ending. I'm ready. A lot occurred between Rose Walker marching into the Dreaming to meet her fate and the final credits of The Sandman. Things kick off with one of the most jaw-dropping of those moments, as Gilbert chooses to stand between his creator and Rose before ultimately transforming back into his original form, the stunning Fiddler's Green. As Dream is set to absorb Rose after realizing that nothing can be done to stop the vortex inside her from consuming the waking world, a delightfully belligerent Unity Kincaid marches into the Dreaming with Lucienne, insisting that her great-granddaughter is not the vortex Morpheus is seeking. Or, rather, she's not supposed to be. Upon revealing that she was impregnated during the sleepy sickness in a dream by someone with golden eyes, Unity helps Dream come to the realization that not only was she supposed to be the Vortex all along, but that his sibling, Desire, intentionally ensured that the unwitting curse was passed down to their descendant Rose in an attempt to make Dream stumble after eons of rivalry. We'll get to the why a bit later. But uh, how? You're dreaming, darling. Anything is possible. While the Rose Walker story gets a happy ending, there's more trouble coming from Dream for all sides. Despite the threat of Dream and Death, ostensibly the most powerful of the Endless that we've met thus far, knocking down their door should they toy with the Dreaming again, Desire seems unfazed and intends to continue to pick at their brother until satisfied. I really got under your skin this time, didn't I? Next time. Meanwhile, Lucifer, Azazel, and the denizens of Hell are making plans to take Hell to the next level by overtaking the waking world, and then the dreaming. That will make God absolutely living. Though this isn't usually the kind of question we go over in stories like this one, there's precedent here. Unlike Prime Video's Good Omens, which covers the original source material in its entirety in the first season and was believed to be a limited series at first, The Sandman goes on for many, many more issues after preludes and nocturnes in the doll's house. There could be many future seasons in store for fans, should Netflix see the performance they want. This is perhaps one of the most straightforward scenes of the series, but it brings with it the most questions. Canonically, Lucifer gets bored with Hell and simply chooses to leave the keys with Dream. While that could be what the character is hinting at when they tell Mazikeen that they plan to do something they've never done before that will make their father livid and bring Morpheus to his knees after Azazel's visit in the last scene of season one, it seems that at least part of the character intends to play with their proverbial food for a time before we see them follow the path originally forged for the purveyor of Hell. Mess with me. Shall forget your family. Why does Desire hate Dream? They don't, but they do have a very strained relationship with their brother. Desire may not hate their sibling, but they are, notoriously, kind of an asshole. Things between the two Endless started to get rough ages ago after Desire made Dream fall for Kilala, a woman who didn't ultimately return Morpheus' feelings and left him for her planet's son. All of Dream's broody proclivities are said to tie back to this key moment in his history, as the entity who fell in love eons ago was more chipper, happier member of the Endless, and the one we see now is, well, learning not to be cruel in his own right. A new book appeared in the library this morning written by Rose Walker. The chances are pretty decent that we'll see Rose Walker return in coming seasons should the series continue. The former Vortex is involved in several stories throughout the Sandman's run, and given how solid Vanessu Simonier's performance was, it seems likely that Gaiman and company would be more than happy to see the character return. There's a missing member of the Endless that gets brought up a few times throughout the series. While he is referred to as the Prodigal now, he was once known as Destruction, and is the only member of the Endless to abandon his duties. He disappeared some 200 years before Dream was captured by Roderick Burgess, and no one has seen him since. It's possible we'll see him come up in the potential season two, but those secrets are better kept for next chapter. Also worth mentioning, he's not the only member of the Endless that we don't meet in season one. The ever serious destiny and the delightfully kooky delirium could grace our screens in the next chapter. 
Gregory, stop, no. Honestly, we don't know. Gregory and Goldie are supposed to work in tandem together, with the two of them often taking care of Abel after Cain murders him. The gargoyle's death came as a huge surprise, but here's hoping it's not the last we see of him. Look at how little Goldie is. She needs a friend. It is you. Dream of the Endless has had quite a few relationships despite his duties constantly pulling him elsewhere. The woman we see imprisoned in hell while Morpheus is on his way to meet Lucifer is named Nada. Once a queen of an ancient African kingdom, Nada came to know Dream as Kakul. The two fell in love despite the universal laws forbidding humans and the Endless from being together, and, in response to their love, the sun destroyed Nada's kingdom. She then kills herself in shame and refuses to be Morpheus's queen in the Dreaming after he seeks her out in the afterlife. Dream, who at this point of his existence is deeply cruel, then imprisons her in hell. There's a strong chance you'll meet her again later, should the series continue, but we'll save those details for later. We're gonna do this together, right? We already are. Right, little man? Since Lyda's son was conceived in the Dreaming, he technically belongs to Morpheus. Rose did threaten Dream to try and ensure the safety of her friend's child, but young Daniel will cross paths with the Dream Lord again down the road, and Lyda could end up playing more of a role in Morpheus' story than you'd expect. This looks like a job for... The Sandman. As hinted at by Jed Walker's dreams of a Sandman-related superhero, caped crusaders have played a not insignificant role in the Sandman canon in the past. Now, rights issues complicate things, and the recent turmoil at Warner Brothers Discovery only stands to make the waters muddier, but there's a strong chance we could see powered individuals in the waking world if the show keeps going long enough. In fact, in Lyda and Hector's original canon, they're both superheroes. Perhaps we'll see her take more of an active role in the series should Rose and their lovely brood return. Thank you.